Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video, I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Nokia stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Nokia is a telecommunications, IT, and consumer electronics company. When the current CEO started last year, he admitted the company was struggling, and unless there were some major changes, the company may not survive. He spun off all the businesses with low margins that were capital intensive and reinvested that money in areas where the company has higher margins and a competitive advantage. He said to expect a flat or down 2021, a flat 2022, and then in 2023, we are going to be a strong and profitable machine like we once were. The company used to be the largest provider of mobile phones in the world but they sold that part of the business to Microsoft in 2014. After the sale, Nokia began to focus more on its telecom infrastructure business and Internet of Things. Nokia returned to the mobile and smartphone market in 2016 through a licensing arrangement with HMD Global. It is also a major patent licensor for most large mobile phone manufacturers. The company is headquartered in Finland and was founded in 1865. It is the largest Finnish company. At the company's peak in the year 2000, it accounted for 4% of the country's GDP. It went public in 1992 and trades on the New York Stock Exchange, Deutsche Börse, London Stock Exchange, Zitra, Vienna, Swiss, Italian Bourse, Prague, Euronext Paris, NASDAQ Stockholm, and NASDAQ Helsinki. Let's get started with the model. This is a large cap company, 33 billion market cap. They're trading at 580 a share and they have 5.6 billion shares outstanding. Let's look at the financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. You see they had negative free cash flow in 18 and 19. Then the new CEO came and they had a positive 1.5 billion. And it's even bigger in a trailing 12 months. So it looks like he's doing the job he said he would. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And they had a really big negative in 2020 and the trailing 12 months. We'll talk more about this later. Revenue is a sales for the company and that's pretty steady around 26, 27 billion dollars a year. This is the company's income statement, all their financials are in euros. One euro equals one dollar and sixteen cents. I converted all the numbers from euros to US dollars in my Excel spreadsheet since we're looking at the ticker that trades in the United States. Here's a breakdown of their 2020 revenue by country. Finland is 1.5 billion euros, which is pretty big because Finland only has 5.5 million people, which is less than New York City, also less than Los Angeles. Their biggest country is the U.S. 6.8 billion of revenue, then France, India, China, and they sell in lots of countries. So you can see 10 billion and other. Here's a breakdown of their revenue by business unit. Their bread and butter is communication service providers, 18 billion euros. Then enterprise, this is their sales to big companies like Google, Facebook, and Microsoft. They generated 1.4 billion from licensing their technology and 925 million and other. A bulk of this is from the sale of two of their units, Alcatel Submarine Networks and Radio Frequency Systems. Below revenue is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. Cost of material, cost of labor, sometimes amortization or depreciation are in cost of revenue. Below that is their gross profit, which is pretty consistent each year. And below that is their operating expenses. Here's a breakdown of their operating expenses, four billion to R&D. This is mainly the payroll to the employees that are working on research and development. They have 2.9 billion in SGNA. Examples are rent and payroll. Then below that is other income and expenses, which are pretty small. So look at their operating income. It went from 334 million to 960 million. The new CEO came, it was 1 billion. Now it jumped way up to 1.8 billion. With less revenue when compared to 18 and 19, they're so much more profitable. Their operating income is so much higher. The CEO is doing what he said. He got rid of the low margin businesses and is focusing on the high margins. They have a decent amount of debt, so they pay 214 million euros of interest on their debt. And the bottom line of the income statement is their net income. And it looks kind of odd, right? Negative net income, a really big negative. 
and they did so well, their operating income was really high. I would just focus on operating income when I look at the income statement. I feel cash flow from operations is even better because it removes the non-cash items on the income statement. So even though they reported 1.5 billion of pre-tax income, it looks like they paid over 3 billion euros of taxes. That's why they have a 1.9 billion euro loss. The reason they passed through this large income tax expense, it was a de-recognition of a Finnish deferred tax asset. A deferred tax asset is a temporary difference carried on the balance sheet that represents income taxes to be received sometime in the future. Another way to put it is if you overpay on your taxes, that money will be returned to you in the form of a tax relief. So it sits on the balance sheet as an asset. The company had this large deferred tax asset sitting on its balance sheet. The company assessed it was unlikely to use that deferred tax asset in the future. So it de-recognized it and passed it through as a loss onto the income statement. Say you had a $50,000 tax credit. It doesn't matter how you got the tax credit. You may have overpaid your taxes last year and that's how you got the credit. Or you bought three Teslas, one for you, one for your wife, and one for your child, and you were given a $50,000 tax credit. Regardless, you have a $50,000 tax credit you can use. Let's say you make $50,000. What happens is the tax credit reduces your $50,000 to zero. So it looks like you made zero. So how much taxes do you pay on zero? You pay no taxes. Let's pretend you did not have the tax credit and you made $50,000 and you usually pay 20% in taxes. So you would have paid $10,000 in taxes, but because you had that $50,000 tax credit, you paid no taxes. So on your personal income statement, without the tax credit, you made $50,000, you had 10,000 taxes, so you have $40,000 of net income. You earned $40,000 for the year. With the tax credit, you made $50,000, the tax credit reduced to zero, you paid zero taxes, you have zero net income. Since you had zero net income, does that mean your job didn't pay you anything? No, they still paid you $50,000, but you just didn't pay any taxes. This is the company's statement of cash flow. As the top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. And look how much cash flow they're generating, 2.7 billion euros. That tax credit is reversed on a statement of cash flows because it's a non-cash item. Just like an example I gave you earlier, it's a non-cash item. You still receive lots of cash even though you made nothing according to your tax return. You actually made more cash. When you think about it, the year your income taxes say you make nothing, you actually generated $50,000 of cash that year, where in a normal year, you would have generated $40,000 of cash. $50,000 minus your $10,000 in taxes. And they do a lot of manufacturing, so they spend a good amount in CapEx, 500 million to 700 million euros a year. Operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow. And they did add some debt in 2020, but they paid down a lot of debt in the trailing 12 months. This is the equity section of the balance sheet. They have 14 billion euros of equity. They have an accumulated deficit. That means their retained earnings historically are negative, negative 3.5 billion euros. They have 16 billion euros of unrestricted equity. This is the first time I've seen unrestricted equity on a company's balance sheet. And I couldn't really find much information online what this represents. I found a little bit, but let me know in the comments if you can explain a little more. So this could be money the company generated, or it could be a donation from an outside party. Wherever it came from, that money is due to the shareholders. So the company can pay out a dividend if they want using that 15.7 billion euros. So I think the easiest thing to do would just be to combine these two numbers, the 15.7 billion and the three and a half billion and call that your retain earnings. Let's look at their capital structure, 16 and a half billion of equity, 7 billion of debt. They're 70% equity, 30% debt. And their net debt is negative 3.3 billion. So they could pay off all the debt with the cash on their balance sheet and still have $3.3 billion of cash left over. Their WAC is 7%. Simply Wall Street has a WAC of 6.87. Finbox has three WACs, 6.57, 7.5. I took the middle WAC for Finbox. And that's a discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year for, that's 51 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. 
We get a value of the company of $46 billion. We divide that by 5.6 billion shares. And we get a calculated stock price of 822. They're trading at 580, so they're trading at a 29% discount. It's a buy according to the model. The average analyst projects their revenue to grow 2.5%. I grew their revenue 2.5% the next four years. That's how I got their future revenue numbers. To get their future free cash flows, I needed to see what percent of their revenue they convert to free cash flows. So I summed up these two free cash flow numbers and I divided by these two revenue numbers. That's about 8%. I multiplied the revenue number by 8%. That's how I got my future free cash flows. And I definitely think this is doable since they're all below the trailing 12 month free cash flow number. So this stock looks like a great buy, but as you know, just because a stock is undervalued according to its fundamentals doesn't mean investors will buy it. Investors look towards the future, and there's still lots of people that think this company is a dog, but they're putting up great numbers, and I wouldn't be surprised if the stock triples next year. Simply Wall Street values the company at $7. They're saying it's 17% undervalued. Nine analysts priced this stock, and their average price target was $7.23. This is where the stock has been trading the last 12 months. So it is up in the past 12 months. You can see this crazy big spike. This is during the GME AMC short squeeze. And this company's stock got wrapped up into that whole mess. So lots of people were buying Nokia, trying to drive the price up, thinking they're applying a short squeeze. The company issued a press release right around that time saying there's no reason the stock should be shooting up so high. And they also mentioned GameStop and AMC and also the Reddit threads. The company stopped paying dividends in October 2019, but I'm pretty sure they're going to bring their dividends back next year because they have lots of cash flow coming in. They have a pretty low beta, 0.59, so the stock isn't too volatile. It's gone up 44% in the past 52 weeks while the S&P went up 24%. The 52-week low was 321, the high was $10, and the stock is trading above it's 50 day and 200 day moving average. This is a really popular stock. Over 20 million shares are traded each day. Of the 5.6 billion shares outstanding, 4.6 billion are on float, 8% are held by institutions, and less than 1% of the shares are shorted. Analysts aren't projecting their revenue to grow too much, but they're projecting their earnings to grow a lot. Because their margins are improving so much, they're a lot more profitable than they were before. Their employee count is actually declining a little bit but they're still maintaining their revenue. They don't need as many employees since they divested their inefficient business units and they're just focusing on the higher margin business units. If you invested $10,000 in this company 10 years ago and reinvested the dividends, you'd have $13,000 today. That's only 2.5% annual return. The biggest shareholder is Solidium. That's a Finnish state-owned investment company. They own 5.2% then Vanguard, BlackRock, Norgus Bank, and a Finnish pension fund. Let's look at their financial ratios. We can't look at the PE since they have negative net income. I stripped out the deferred tax asset on their income statement and recalculated their net income. And their net income in US dollars is 1.9 billion. Their market cap is 33 billion. So their PE is 17, which is pretty good. Their price to sales is also good at 1.3 and their price to book is 2.0. Their ROIC has improved a lot. It's at 13%. They're much more profitable now. They can cover their interest payments eight times. Negative ROE. They have a good current ratio and quick ratio. They have nearly 9 billion euros of cash on their balance sheet. And the company is really well funded. They have 2.5 billion of free cash flow in the trailing 12 months. 7.7 .7 billion of working capital. So they have over $10 billion of funding. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to companies in the same industry, I've done videos of 10 companies in the same industry as Nokia. And if Nokia has a number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in blue, they're better than the average. We can't look at their PE, but if we stripped out the deferred tax asset, their PE will be better than average. Their price to sales and price to book is much better than average. They have a good current ratio. They have negative ROE, but the average in the industry is actually worse, negative 19%. They're 30% debt, so they're better than average. And their market cap is really close to the average. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 29% discount. But I've been saying for several quarters now, this stock should really blow up. And I think it's just a matter of time till the stock price gets way up there. The new CEO was actually director of the company in its heyday for about 15, 20 years. And now he came back to run the company and he's doing an amazing job.
I rank their free cash flows 9 out of 10, their revenue 7 out of 10, and their ratio is 5 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.